well, I had to stay home during the war years. I had to be on the island because of the fact that, like I said, all the boys were drafted. They didn't have enough help. I worked like a boy in the story. What did you do? Well, I unpacked cases of canned peas, you know, everything. And if you were a customer, you came in and you'd tell me five pounds of sugar and I'd run and get it, five pounds of flour, I'd run and get it. And cookies came in a bin, I would weigh them out with the same dirty hands that you used for everything else, you know, making change and everything. And I could cut a pound of cheese right on the dot. You know, that wheel of cheese, I learned to hit it right on the dot which was a big accomplishment, and I sliced meat like the girls at the deli. You did everything and carried the bags of groceries out if the people wanted you to. And Gloria Swanson was here one summer, and she had a chauffeur who came shopping, and he would give you 50 cents. Well, we all wanted to take his groceries out to his car because 50 cents, that was a big portion. I only got $3 a week in the store pay. And I asked my father for a raise. He said, you get bored in rooms, so I couldn't have any more pay. My father was extremely giving, very, very giving. And a woman told me that I worked with in school that if it hadn't been for my father, they couldn't have eaten. That two winters he carried them. Her father tried to pay it back in the summer when he had more work. But in the winter, he didn't. But he was extremely good-hearted that way. He wouldn't let anyone starve. If they didn't have any money, just charge, 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 and he'd rip them all up. He was so darn soft-hearted that he wouldn't carry ice cream because Mrs. LeBeau had to make a living. It took years before we could talk him into, when we delivered groceries to West Chop, before we could say, but look, every time you need ice cream, you have to go buy it from her to send to these people in West Chop. It's ridiculous. So we finally got a little freezer, a little tiny freezer. That was one of the few times my mother came to the store because she had to see the freezer. She never shopped. My father did it. Our Jewish observances were a priority. That was a great concern to our families that their children should be brought up in this new environment and new, literally, non-Jewish atmosphere, that they would have the strength of knowing that they were of the Jewish faith and could worship as such and carry on our culture and traditions. Our families were industrious. They worked very, very hard. It was important to earn a living because they all came here not speaking the language and with half a penny in their pocket. They were not moneyed or educated, highly educated or professional. In Europe, in East Europe anyway, they've had their Jewish education, but they didn't have education as children went to school, they, they were put out as apprentices to learn a trade, and their village life was meager. However, when they came here, their performance on the island as immigrants, their sense of responsibility, trust, sterling character, was the basis of today's acceptance of jewelry on the island. We must never forget to pay tribute to our pioneers for this. It didn't happen just like that, that doors were open today for jewelry on the island as they are. There were many closed doors, and by example and hard work, our community paved the way. My father and mother were they alive, would be proud that they left a legacy, and all fathers and mothers who were here, of an incorporated Jewish community, a building, a cemetery, a Sunday school, and a program on which today is built on this foundation, as it was then, without paid leadership. Our community went from orthodox to conservative to reform. Our elders would be accepting of this as long as the Jewish faith was carried on. I always remember my father and Mr. Kronig Sr. always talked about this. 
If there were to be changes, it was all right, as long as the thread of Judaism would be carried on. We pay tribute to our pioneer community members for the foresight, perseverance, and endeavors in a Christian community to establish that which provided the opportunity of the seeds of Judaism, which were planted on Martha's Vineyard, and to contribute richly in so many ways to the island. And we pay tribute to the present Jewish community under paid leadership for its continued activity to serve the growing Jewish population on Martha's Vineyard. The center. I love that little building. It was just wonderful. You know, the people today, they're doing a great job at the center and it's very interesting programs and all. But you know, we really started the whole thing going. We had speakers, we had so many things. You know who we had one night? We had Adam Clayton Powell. We had Ogden National S.J. Perelman. We had loads of very interesting people. Of course, the center was very small at that time. They were hanging from the rafters, but the, the Friday night services were wonderful. We had a women's club. You know, the women would get together like maybe every three or four weeks, you know, in the beginning. We used to have Mother's Day teas, and I'll never forget. I stayed up till two o'clock in the morning making fancy cookies and, and cakes. And everybody had a little poem or something, you know. And one of the women got sore at me because her little girl didn't have a part to say. She was a little tiny thing, what could she say? And we used to have Father's Day breakfast, which was great. We used to have graduation parties. And then when the boys went off to war, they were always given a wonderful send off and a gift. All these events be at the center? Oh yes, and that's why it was so important to have the center because by that time there were more people and everybody had kids. There were all kinds of things going on and not only in the center. Like I was saying to Dottie, I said, Dottie, you forget some of the things. Remember the picnics we used to have on the lagoon? Henry Kronig had bought, you know what, on the lagoon where Leonard Bernstein used to say, well, that was Henry Kronig's land and we used to have picnics there. It was wonderful. And who would be we used to have picnics? The whole Jewish community. At that point, there was the Brickmans, the Isaacsons, the Osman family. There were a few families that came afterwards that stayed for a number of years. The Miller family. Anybody that was around or if anybody was visiting, everybody was always invited. So how many people would be at one of these? You could probably get about 50, 40, 50 people with the kids and all, you know, as approximately. Yeah. And even, if, even with the small group that we had in the beginning, uh, when we'd have uh, beach parties, We'd get together on the, on the beach, and Dorothy had her car, and somebody else might have had a car, and you just loaded everybody in. And it was nice. Everybody was together, and you just did things. You make a fire, and you have hot dogs and hamburgers, or people would make uh, salads. We've had some wonderful picnics down at Katema. We'd have a fire and, you know, sit around and sing. And another thing that we did... We used to have moonlight sails over to Falmouth. Get hold of Frankie Vincent's boat and Ziggy Piva. Ziggy would come along uh, with his guitar and everybody would sing. It was fun. I mean, really, you know, you, you made your own good times. That's what it is. You didn't have everything just handed to you, like today. We had a very traditional Jewish home. We had a kosher home. We could not eat the meat that everybody ate. The meat had to be blessed and cut a certain way. And Were there difficulties on the island getting kosher food? No, you couldn't get it on the island. My mother used to have, every week she would order, and it would come from Boston. We children would write the butcher order because my mother didn't write English. And on an island, like a couple of boats a day, I can remember when the winters were so severe that sometimes we wouldn't have a boat for three or four days at a time. The whole harbor was frozen. And here's what my mother worked out. My sister Ida or Rose or I, we would write a butcher order. My mother would tell us what she wanted. The butcher first was in New Bedford and later in Boston. 
and our meat used to come by train and boat. Was it somewhat preserved at that point? No, yes, raw, raw meat, meat, no. And, and we never got water. sick either, did we, Dorothy? No. no. It came packed in ice, and when the meat came, there was a great big enamel tray almost the size of the table, and my mother would oh, open up the package of meat and the chicken, whatever it was she ordered, and all of that was put on this big tray. She koshered the meat, it was soaked, and then all of the meat was salted with coarse salt for about an hour to take out the impurities. And then it would be rinsed. We had we didn't have refrigerators in those days. We had ice boxes. My mother would wrap up the meat and she'd put it in the ice box. And then when my father bought the building, which is now Brickman's, he made the entire upstairs into a great big apartment, and that's where we lived. And then Papa had a big porch built in the back, and he made shelves. And our winters used to be very, very frigid. And Mama would pack up her meat and put them up in the shelves. In the winter, it was like a deep freeze. They'd be frozen all winter. And then much of our... Jewish culture also stems a lot from the German culture, like the foods that we have and many of the ways of life, too. And so we grew up eating hard, crusty bread, big round loaves of dark, crusty bread. But there wasn't that kind of bread on the island, so we would write in the butcher order to go to the Jewish bakery and get the bread for us. and. All our lives, we called the dark bread butcher bread because the butcher used to send us the bread. When you have a kosher home, you don't mix meat and dairy products, and you don't mix meat and dairy dishes either. You had a separate set of dishes for dairy, and you had a separate set of dishes for meats. And when it came Passover, you had the same way, two separate sets of dishes. And then for Passover, we cleaned the house from top to bottom. The curtains changed, the bedspreads changed, the rugs cleaned. Because Passover, you could not have anything that had anything to do with breadcrumbs. Because that's when we had lots of the unleavened bread. And everything in the house was cleaned so carefully that there'd be no breadcrumbs around. It was a very special holiday, and the butcher used to go to the Jewish markets and buy this were very, very important. Now, my father and mother were extremely observant, and when it came time for the high holy days, Papa would close the store and put a sign on the door, closed for the Jewish holidays. Nobody does that now. Everybody keeps open. And we'd go to New Bedford, the whole family, and stay in a rooming house and go to services there at the synagogue. Later, we used to go to Boston. Of course, people today have changed a lot. Yes, they have. They really have. They observe it, but not the way they were brought up. 